Welcome, welcome, welcome. What's up, guys? How are you? Give me some donuts or some hearts or some fires if you can see and hear me if we're coming in hot. Uh, welcome, Sabrina, Slowboy, Paul, Jethro, Melissa. Who else is here? Technor, welcome. John Connor, he was here. Dejire gave me some thumbs up and hearts. Okay, we're doing it. Welcome to the Wonka life of Walt Disney. And while we're waiting for some more people to trickle in, I did get a super chat last week about my top 10 bands. Uh, 10 bands to know me. I guess this was going around on Twitter last week. So I couldn't think of um, all on the spot, but I wrote some down. I just, I couldn't narrow it down to 10. And I figured out I'd like a solo artist more than I like bands for some reason. But here goes while we wait for everybody to pile in. Um, number one, Jackson 5. Shout out to the Jackson 5. Um, my favorite genre of music is Motown. So I'm going to love anything from Sam Cooke, Smokey Robinson, um, James Brown, Jackson 5. I just think that um, little Michael Jackson was so talented, so fun to watch. So that's number one. Um, number two, these are in no particular order. Anyways, um, Mariah Carey. Uh, she ruled the 90s for me. I think she made the biggest impact musically on me. Uh, so, do I need more mods? <laughs> sure, why not? Let's get every single uh, chatter in here a blue wrench. No, I'm just kidding. What's up, Clint? Glad you made it. Sabrina. I like all these uh, emojis going on. We're talking about 10 bands to know me. Someone gave me a super chat last week saying, tell me your bands that you like. So I was thinking about it. I wrote them down. So Jackson 5, um, Mariah Carey. I mean, I can't think of a more impressive vocalist. I mean, maybe there is one out there, but as far as like pop music, uh, Mariah Carey will always be the queen of divas for me, I think. Um, number three, I said Flaming Lips. Number four, we talk about Peter Gabriel a lot already. Um, number five, Elvis, the king. I do love Elvis. My mom loves Elvis. Um, there's just, he's got that je ne sais quoi. He's the king of rock and roll. Number six, um, I said Sam Cooke, Smokey Robinson, all the Motown people, Supremes, just anything from that era is going to um, put me in a good mood. Number seven, Ed Sheeran. I don't know. <laughs> I know a lot of guys don't like Ed Sheeran, but to me, I think he can't. <sighs> he just writes the most beautiful love songs. Like, as far as pop music goes, there's no better songwriter for me um, than Ed Sheeran. Every song that he writes sounds like your old favorite love song. So, um, and then number eight, just to go out on a limb here, I did used to love country music a lot in the 90s. I still like it, um, but in the 90s, there was nobody better than Garth Brooks, obviously, and Alan Jackson is a big one. Um, Chris Stapleton, now I like for country music. <laughs> Jamie, what? <laughs> well, I like Garth Brooks. Yeah, I did. Um, I don't... <sighs> I don't have like a music collection that I listen to now. I've gone through a lot of eras, like collecting tapes, collecting CDs, collecting vinyl records, but as you move and you lose things and you sell things, and so I just don't, I don't really have a lot of my music in one place. I love listening to what other people are into. Um, I like Coulter Wall. That's more, I wouldn't say that's country, that's more like folksy, bluesgrassy, but for um, distinctive, interesting voices, I like Coulter Wall a lot. Um, and classic rock bands, I like Journey. So I, you can always sing along to a good Journey song. It will get you pumped up. So welcome tonight. We're gonna be talking about um, 
the weird life of Walt Disney, the messed up psyche that created the Disney empire and where did it all go wrong? Where t friends with uh, Nazi, oh, I said a bad word, N-A-Z-I scientists, um, <clears throat> in the FBI, his life is a lot more interesting than people give him, uh, I don't want to say credit for, but, but people know about. And, um, just so you know, Walt Disney was not, I repeat, not a Freemason, and we're going to talk about that and exactly what was he. He was Demolay. He was not a Mason. So, me and Paul, um, about maybe six months ago, we were doing our Disney shows, and I did bring out some of this stuff back then, but we're just gonna go laser focus, deep dive into the life of Walt Disney. But before th that, I wanna talk about this event that happened in Glasgow. Now, this has got me cracking up like all week because of what happened to these poor kids in Glasgow. Not that it's funny, but just this is how you get treated by something called the Illuminati, House of Illuminati. So there was a Willy Wonka event that was put on by something called House of Illuminati. And I'm gonna pull that up right now. So House of Illuminati, it says about us, a realm where fantasy and reality converge to create unparalleled immersive experiences. Our journey is fueled by a passion for playing art, technology, and storytelling into unforgettable events, from avant-garde performances to grand interactive ga galas. Each event is meticulously crafted an adventure designed to evoke wonder and inspire imagination. At the House of Illuminati, we're not just organizing events, we're crafting extraordinary experiences that, that linger in your memories, inviting you to explore the extraordinary and step beyond the ordinary. So, one of their events was the immersive Willy Wonka experience for children and it it did not go very well leaves of grass says journey is my jam it's my jam too uh what's that one song do 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 oh it'll come back to me in a second that every time i hear that i get pumped like even the introduction to that song i just like cannot sit down but yeah journey is awesome um what else Dr. Crispy, welcome. Glad you made it. We were looking at some Disney movies on um, Amazon last night, and there's like a whole grip of them that I'd never even heard of. I was like, you're just making this up at this point. Like, I'd never even heard of all these animal movies that they have and just weird. So maybe if I can ever get Paul to come back on with me, we can do some more weird Disney's. That'll be fun. Let's see. Christian Pethukov. Five dollars. Thank you. From one Journey fan to another, do you like them still with Arnel Pineda? He was the best possible replacement, I think. Yeah, he sounds just like him. Um, that's the Filipino guy, right? And yeah, so <laughs> one rabbit hole I've been going down is like Filipino TikTok. Like, why are they all so good at karaoke? It's pretty astonishing actually like how many Filipinos have awesome voices so yeah I don't mind it oh separate ways that's the song I was thinking of don't stop believing that's a great one that's like the perfect karaoke song too So, this House of Illuminati, they're throwing these mystique galas, they're throwing avant-garde art parties, they're throwing interactive, immersive theater experiences, one of them is called Techno-Mythical, witness the fusion of ancient myths and modern technology in our techno-mythical shows. These events combine folklore and futuristic elements, creating spectacular performance, blah blah blah. Secret soirees they throw, uh, enchanted retreats. And their latest one is going to be Witchcraft and Wizardry. So the, the Willy Wonka immersive experience that they gave these kids was 
um, hilarious. We're going to look at some TikToks about that because it was written by AI. First of all, the, um, the advertisements that they put out for this event were all AI, so it looked super trippy and cool and uh, lush and very Wonka-esque, but when they got there, this is what they saw. So let me pull this up. Let's see. Paying $40 for entry and then seeing this. That's what happened in Willie's Chocolate Experience Immersive Event in Glasgow, Scotland, inspired by, but not affiliated with, the Wonka franchise. The event organizers apparently used artificial intelligence to generate promotional images that suggested a very high-quality attraction. However, parents were horrified when they showed up to this, a mostly empty warehouse with scattered tapestries and decorations. The best way to describe this is something that you would see at a birthday party, rather than a big extravaganza, one participant noted. It's being called the fire fest of immersive events. Police were even called it. Yeah, it was so bad. Some of the parents were calling the police saying we want our money back because the part of the script that the AI wrote, it put in this weird character that is not from the Wonka uh, canon called the unknown, which was this scary thing. <laughs> the unknown, they called it the evil candy maker who lives in the walls. What is that thing? And so... <coughs> It would just like pop out and scare kids from behind the mirror. And I think that's so funny, like AI was trying to put something scary in there and they're like, what do people fear? The unknown. So <laughs> this uh, black ghoul with a silver mask is coming out from behind the, the mirror as the kids <laughs> enter. You can just hear the kids going, no, I don't want to see him. Look. It's the unknown. No. <laughs> what is that? It's the unknown. No. So, traumatizing kids, um, ripping them off. Uh, it was supposed to be some kind of candy wonderland, but they got one jelly bean per child and one, like, lame old cup of lemonade, like half a cup of lemonade as their prize. What else is going on here? More shocking details emerge about the now viral £35 Willy Wonka immersive experience. Umber Lumper Kirsty Patterson was forced to wear a pound shop costume and handed an AI-generated gibberish script. She was left angry and embarrassed, completely unaware of the true nature of the event. She still <laughs> hasn't been paid. Kids were left crying as they were confronted by a made-up villain called The Unknown. What is that? It's The Unknown! An evil chocolate maker who lives in the walls. Completely traumatized, the kids had to console themselves with a single jelly bean and a cup of lemonade, as there was no chocolate. The police were called. Now families are demanding a refund. More shocking details emerge. Yeah. About so, what? This is the kind of stuff you'd expect from a company called House of Illuminati. Uh, poor kids. <laughs> no, that's that cracked me up. This is like the Wonka you have at home. Like if you want to go to the Wonka's chocolate factory and your mom says no we have Wonka at home this is what you get right what other tiktoks do we got going here come with me oh here's a good one come with me and you'll be in a bare industrial location cat dating cat cheese hunts and some adventuring entertainment like if uh, Charles Dickens wrote a immersive experience for poor little British kids, you get one jelly bean. If you don't eat your meat, you don't get your jelly bean. So yeah, that's what you can come to expect from things that are affiliated with Illuminati. Oh, and I looked up this House of Illuminati uh, company and I came across this book 
on Amazon, and I don't know if it's the same people, but it says House of Illuminati wrote the 66 laws of the Illuminati, the secrets of success published in the year 2013. So this looks like a hoot and a holler actually. Um, I really want to get it. It's only $10. So if someone sends me 10 donuts tonight and says, get this uh, 66 laws of Illuminati, we're gonna, I'll, I'll get it and we'll roast it here on your live. But it says this book is written, um, Breaking the Years of Silence, Making Known the Laws, and oh, remember 66 is the number of the fallen angels. We talked about that on the Super Bowl live stream. So chapter one details the um, guaranteed guide to success, the larger age-old proverbial wisdom which sheds light on a principle of good character. Mm -hmm. Chapter two is a letter to the youth of the present age a letter written by the Illuminati to the youth of the 21st century is a passionate epistle in response to comments made by rap artist Jay-Z and negative inaccurate rumors which were circulating at the time. So this is like the, the Manly P. Hall take of the Illuminati, which uh, is like the great white brotherhood that has always been behind all of the great... Uh, <sighs> leaps forward in progress for mankind or these secret Illuminati, the, the, the good guys, the white hats, you know, the, the people that don't need any um, recognition for all the great things they're doing. So, um, yeah, we're going to be doing Manly P. Hall's uh, Secret Destiny of America on Rockfin probably tomorrow. I'll be recording that, so look for that soon. I do not share the um, respect for the Illuminati that Manly... P. Hall does, or as Jay likes to call him, Manly P. Hall, Manly Palmer Hall. I don't agree with his take that um, the people in the shadows are doing all of this for the good of mankind. So maybe if we get 10 donuts, we'll get this silly thing and we'll uh, roast it at a later date. So what's going on in the chat? Lots of coffee, lots of owls. Lots of donuts. I like it. Let's check the donuts. See if we got one. If you want to view paradise. Oh, Aisha, $10. Okay, Aisha, you got it. We're getting that 66 laws of the Illuminati book. And just for you, we are going to read that goofy thing and uh, roast it. In an upcoming live, that sounds really fun. But tonight, the main thing I wanted to talk about was Walt Disney the man, because this entire empire was built on the name of, you know, Walter Elias Disney, and just like they make up any other um, cultural hero for you, there's always the real person and the facade. There's always the wizard behind the curtain and what they're showing you. So we're gonna go behind the curtain tonight and look at old Walt Disney, who was the voice behind the mouse. So last time we did a live, we were talking all about Psychology Inc. Who has the monopoly on life? And back when I was writing this, it was Disney for sure. Um, we were talking about Edward Bernays. And Bernays said, the conscious and intelligent manipulation of the habits and opinions of the masses is an important element in democratic society. Those who manipulate this unseen mechanism of society constitute an invisible government, which is the true ruling power of our country. We are governed, our minds are molded, our tastes formed, our ideas suggested largely by men we have never heard of. Our invisible governors are in many cases unaware of the identity of their fellow members in the inner cabinet. It is they who pull the wires which control the public mind, who harness old social forces and contrive new ways to bind and guide the world. So here's what we are dealing with when we're talking about um, Walt Disney. Now, I have an entire shelf full of Disney biographies, Disney um, critiques, just like an entire, probably at least 20 books on Walt Disney World, Walt Disney Land, Walt Disney the Person, um, coming from all different perspectives, right? Fans and uh, critics, both. And this is what I 
used to write this chapter. And here's a person who really kind of shaped the American mind in a way um, in the 20th century. And here's a quote from one of his biographers called Neil Gabler. And it says, I think his largest bequest is a matter of the American mind. Walt Disney helped change the national consciousness. He got people to believe in the power of wish fulfillment in their own ability to impose their wills on reality. And the will, remember, uh, that's all Alistair Crowley and Thelema and uh, Nietzscheism and uh, will to power. And the will is very important um, in ritual magic. So back to the quote, it says, that's what Walt Disney did all his life. He managed to replace reality with his illusions. What some people now refer to disparagingly as Disneyfication. He sold us on the idea of control because Walt Disney was himself a master of control. We see the results everywhere from film to theme parks to virtual reality to virtual politics. Um, and that was from a book called... Da, da, da. Uh, Walt, Life of Walt Disney, Will, Neil Gabler, yeah. So, this guy, Walter Elias Disney, he's probably one of the most beloved names um, on the planet, um, at least for, you know, the 20th century. His status as an international icon and his influence on popular culture cannot be underestimated. Um, few people have been awarded more accolades and honors than Walt Disney in his lifetime. Oh, what's up, Rachel? Rachel's here. She says, Pretty Lady reveals Disney's deepest secrets, top tier content if I've ever seen it. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Paul says, The Gabler book is good read. In terms of psychology, it's more Freudian than Jungian, though. So in my unmasked for opinion, Gabler only gets the tip of the Disney iceberg. Yeah, He's definitely, um, you know, not a hard-hitting uh, expose type journalist author. Uh, he was pro Disney for sure. I've got my my babe kombucha tonight. Oh, and I wanted to say before we started the show, but. A lot of you were complaining about commercials on YouTube. I don't know what I can do about that. Um, when I set the the monetization, I don't remember if it asked me like lots of commercials or little. I, I'm just not very good at this. If you could just do me a solid and just do this when the commercial comes up, I mean, like it would really help me out because I, I don't know how to change it. I'm not trying to be greedy. I just, I'm not good at this. Uh, so, you know, if you could just like, uh, help me out and like do this when the commercial comes on that would be really fun instead of writing me nasty messages and calling me greedy so it is tasty Rachel it's uh pineapple and fresh mint craft kombucha babe I like it so Disney himself he has personally won 22 Academy Awards out of 59 nominations, and he holds the record for both at the time that I wrote this book. This was 2012, so I'm not sure if that's still correct, but I don't know anybody else who would have that many. Um, <clears throat> Additionally, he has also earned four honorary Oscars, um, his last one being granted posthumously. Disney, along with members of his staff, have received 48 Academy Awards, seven Emmys, and more than 950 honors and citations from almost every nation in the world. So this isn't just an American thing, um, the love of Disney, but it is part of the propagation of American culture, of Western culture around the world. And uh, Disney was a huge part of that, especially after um, communism. And as we're going to see, he also was working for the FBI, but we'll get there in a second. So his personal awards include honorary degrees from Harvard, Yale, UCLA, um, 
France's Legion of Honor, and Officer de Academy decorations, Thailand's Order of the Crown, Brazil's Order of the Southern Cross, Mexico's Order of the Aztec Eagle, and the Showman of the World Award from the National Association of Theater Owners. Um, in 1964, he was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom, which is the highest honor that a civilian can be awarded. Though it may be given for singular acts of momentous import, it is generally conferred only for a lifetime of service. So why was he giving or being given a military award? Hmm, interesting, right? Uh, so Disney is heralded as the, you know, exemplary model of a character of American enterprise. You know, you can come from nothing and become the world's uh, most premier um, filmmaker and imagineering Wonka man, right? Oh, the nubs are here. Man, that makes me laugh so much, you guys, with the nubs. Nubs and sweet cream is still funny to me. I don't know. Nubs for life. Yeah, that's so funny. Andrea Kane says, I'm having the talk with my oldest two children about influencers, movies, and media of today. It's not easy, but I should have them watch your videos. Yes, please do. And remember the other two books that um, are for sale on jaysanalysis.com slash shop are written specifically for that demographic for young adults and teens. It's got full color pictures. It's got easy to understand um, concepts and it's all about what they uh, consume every day on a daily basis so oh and I did we were talking about dolls last time and I did find some pictures of dolls because we were talking about like uh, brats and stuff that was early 2000s and I did happen to go to a like a Target or a Walmart recently and snap some pictures of what the dolls look like now. Here we go. They are very evil looking. Um, what are these? Rainbow High. Rainbow, I don't even know what that, Rainbow Vision? Oh, Shadow High. Okay, so these are Shadow High dolls, Rainbow Vision. That reminds me of Young. Where's Paul? Is he up here? So Shadow High, Rainbow. Um, here's some more Shadow High dolls. And like a, like a black, per I mean a black, black doll. Like not even black skin color. It's crazy. So yeah, there's what we are dealing with now. Shadow High. Dolls. So was Disney the ultimate example of a human being or was he the ultimate example of the ability of the sorcerers to create an idol? Um, and as we are about to see behind the curtain, Walt Disney was a deeply troubled individual. It wasn't all fun and games and Mickey Mouse cartoons for for Walt, um, the official story of his early life is that he was born in Chicago in 1901 as the fourth son to Elias and Flora Disney. So that's where he got his middle name. And the baby was named after the preacher of the St. Paul Christian Church, Walter Parr. In 1903, Elias, the dad, began preaching out against the moral corruption of the big city and moved the family to a farm in Marceline, Missouri. Um, Walt's father was a very strict fundamentalist who considered himself a morally righteous man, um, but he also had a dark side. He loved bars, he loved loose women, he loved whiskey and gambling and the debts he incurred may have been the reason for the family's sudden relocation, not just to have a fresh, wholesome start. So Marceline is the place that Main Street Disneyland is built after. So he took these elements of his um, 
childhood and he put them in Disney World and that's where you get the feeling that you are in like peak Americana times when you walk down the street, the main street in Disneyland. So in Missouri, um, Little Walt and his brother Roy Disney were forced to earn their own keep at the family apple farm. So Elias, the dad, would use corporal punishment to increase productivity and woodshed beatings were administered daily. So this poor family had to endure, you know, an alcoholic father, um, abusive, um, and it's always the ones who are like that who rail so much about moral corruption, you know, and it's always the ones who are the worst, who are always saying how bad everything else is. What are you guys talking about ducks? So, this trauma caused the boys to cling to each other and secretly wonder and hope that Elias was not their real father. Um, the Disney family's evening dinner often included long diatribes from Elias against the capitalist economy and the exploitation of America's working class by what he thought was a conspiracy of wealthy JEWs in control of the world's investment banks. So Elias <laughs> was talking about this way back then. He sounds a little communist to me. He's talking about like the evil capitalist economy and the JEWs in control of the investment banks. So Here's some weird ideas getting into Walt's, uh, not, I don't want to say weird ideas because there is something to that, um, but we're not talking about that right now. So despite his father's harsh treatment um, and hard work on the farm, farm, Walt saw his time in Missouri as the happiest of his life and something he was always trying to recreate at Disneyland. He loved the town uh, so much, like I said, he incorporated it into the theme park. And <clears throat> in 1909, the family moved to Kansas City, where Walt and Roy were forced to work on their father's paper route, delivering two daily editions seven days a week for no pay. So here is Baby Walt. Baby Walt to me. Here's Marceline, Missouri. It says Walt Disney Heritage Museum. Here's Walt when he joined the Red Cross. Here is his happy place, the 1950 recreated barn from Marceline as home in California. He used it as his personal workshop. It became his happy place and the birthplace of Disney Imagineering, this barn right there that he recreated. So they're delivering papers seven days a week, getting up at the crack of dawn, working their butts off for no pay. Um, child Walter could often be found taking catnaps in the alley for some much needed rest since the route would have them waking up at 3 a.m. So for the rest of his life, he would have a reoccurring nightmare that he had missed a customer along his route and had to deliver it before his dad found out. So when Walt little Walt could even sneak in some playtime. His favorite game was to play Jimmy Dale, a junior secret agent. So this is something that is getting into the milieu in um, early 1900s to 1950s, 60s is um, secret agents and superheroes. And so we already know, we have established that he looks up to secret agents and, you know, he might want to grow up to be one someday. And we're going to get to that in just a second. So before Roy ran away from home, he taught Walt how to stand up to his father so that he would be all right without him. Um, one story has Walt confronting Elias when he was just 10 years old 
and his father ne never tried to beat him um, physically again. So some heavy, heavy childhood issues for this poor guy. In 1917, Roy enlisted in the Navy to fight World War I, and Walt made up his mind that he was going to enlist too. So this is kind of a sweet relationship between the brothers. You know, Roy is his big brother and the protector of him against his father. Uh, obviously, Walt idolizes Roy and wants to do everything that he does. And so Roy joins up to fight in World War I, when the local recruiter asked to see Walt's birth certificate, Walt wrote to the Hall of Records in Chicago and they answered that there was no record of it. So this is going to start a lifelong um, questioning of his uh, parentage, of his heritage, of who he really is, who his father really is, um, is his mother really his mother? So this is uh, the first clue that Walt is receiving that things are not exactly the way that he was told that they were. So he tried contacting the Department of Vital Statistics and their response only added to the mystery. There was a record of a Walter Disney born to Elias and Flora Disney in 1891, which was impossible as he was obviously not 26 years old yet. Um, when he questioned his parents about it, they reacted strangely and gave him vague answers and an empty promise to look further into the matter, which they never did. So from that time on, he no longer felt that he could trust them. Um, he feared that he had uncovered a terrible secret that he might be adopted or an illegitimate child. So he did manage to get into the war by getting his mother to sign a permission slip to join the Red Cross. Um, his father was against this, but his mother knew that he was determined to do whatever Roy was going to do. So she did that for him. He was still a year too young. So when his mother made out the affidavit saying that he was born in 1901, um, when she turned her back, Walt picked up the pen and changed the one into a zero, making him old enough to um, enlist. So in November 1918, Walt sailed to France um, as part of the Red Cross Ambulance Corps and during his overseas service, he became a chauffeur to officers and military officials in France and through the Rhine country of occupied Germany. For money, for extra pocket money, he was already thinking his little showbiz uh, brain, um, props, and um, relics, he would take battle, uh, things that were left over from battles, he would dress them up, um, he would coat the insides of helmets with grease and hair and blood and put holes in them to make expensive souvenirs. So this just kind of shows um, that he could be, you know, a little deceptive if he thought that there was an advantage to it. So let's check out what's going in the chat. We are talking about the Wonka life of Walt Disney. We're talking about um, nubs and sweet cream and donuts. <laughs> and what else? Missouri has a commie state motto. What is it? Salus populi suprema lex esto. What does that mean? Populates people supreme. I don't know what does that mean to the boy. Salus populi suprema lex esto. I kind of like Latin actually. Yeah, people were more trusting back then. That's true. Hop over to the donuts and see if there's anything anyone wants me to say. There is. 
$10 from Edward the third. It says in regards to manly P the only person who's doing any good for man humanity in the shadows is Batman. <laughs> okay. Yes. I'll give you that. He is the hero that we deserve. Batman in the shadows. Exactly. Silas Populi Suprema Lex Esto. Let the welfare of the people be the supreme law. Okay. All right. Cooper says Bambi was the first anti-firearm movie. Um, good point. And we have, at the end of this chapter, a whole weird stuff box about the movie Bambi. So stay tuned. So Disney was Hollywood's last hope. Um, he was the thing to bring this Babylonian city out of the quagmire that it had found itself in. Um, the, they were referring to it as Sin City. And you, um, I don't know, we've all seen the movie Babylon right now. So this is the era that uh, Walt Disney is entering into um, adulthood and into working in Los Angeles. So Paul says, to who ask, his parents didn't abandon him, but Walt bought his parents a house and he struck it rich and the heating unit messed up and the CO2 poisoning killed his mother. So sad. Yes, that was very, um, a weird, tragic freak accident. Melissa says, Bambi was terrifying for me as a kid for sure. Yeah, it's supposed to be, and it's supposed to make you hate hunters and men. Bambi, Dumbo, both of them. Someone says, did you know that Walt would draw an inverted pentagram every time he drew Mickey Mouse? Well, you think you can stump me on Disney lore? Okay, you can't. And if somebody scoops me and goes on like a big show like Joe Rogan or like something talking about Disney and it's not me, I'm going to be really pissed because I have a picture of that very thing that you're talking about. And we'll get to that next week when we talk about World of Warcraft and Walt Disney on the front lines of um, <sighs> propaganda. So yes, exactly. Here is the hand of Walt Disney drawing a pentagram and drawing Mickey Mouse right inside the pentagram. So, spot on, I would throw you a donut hole if I had one. So, during this time, early Hollywood, Great Depression, um, many Americans believed that the country's financial hardships were a partial result of its moral decline and a large part of blame from this was focused on Hollywood, which they call Babylon and Sin City. So Hollywood has always been associated with ancient Babylon, the columns and decor of the Kodak Center. It's not called that anymore. It's called something else. I'll figure it out when we go um, to LA, but it's no longer called the Kodak Center, but they used to have a giant archway from the scene from the movie Intolerance about Babylon, and you've got uh, Anunnaki, this is probably Enki right here, and you've got this uh, dude who I think I have identified him as called Nusku. He's not holding the pine cone, which he usually holds in his hand as the sign for like the pineal gland, but this is just from a movie set. But um, <clears throat> yeah, it's from the 1960 movie Intolerance by D.W. Griffith, who was recreating the colossal court of um, Belshazzar, the king of Babylon, from the book of Daniel. So the stock market crash of the Great Depression caused an enormous bitterness from Americans towards who they felt were responsible for the nation's collapse, which was the Jewish financiers on Wall Street and the Jewish, um, um, what do you call those, production houses? No. Production companies. And if you don't think that Hollywood started out Jewish, that's crazy because there's a whole book about it called uh, Something of Their Own, An Empire of Their Own, How the Jews Created Hollywood. So I'm not anti-Jew or anti-Jewish or anything like that, but it is uh, an interesting thread to follow that uh, a lot of 
this Babylonian um, degeneracy in Hollywood was from Jewish studios. <laughs> Movie houses. <laughs> I'm thinking in like medieval times. Okay, Techmar Graphics, $4.99. Thank you so much. I'll give you a heart right back and a thumbs up. How do you like that? Appreciate that. A nubgram? You guys are funny. Mary Nubbins? Nubby Poppins? Yeah. I don't know. Am I allowed to say the word? The J word? I don't think all J's are evil. But there's crazy cabals going on. So they needed a nice white guy, <laughs> a nice um, Christian defender of family values. And to defend itself, the leaders of the film industry needed a wholesome role model whose films could be seen as fun for the whole family, and they found their best hope in Walt Disney. The rabbi to the stars, Edgar Magnin, was the spiritual leader of the major movie makers who were part of the Los Angeles B'nai B'rith. Now, I know Clint's in here. He can tell you all about B'nai B'rith, I'm sure, if you want to drop some nubs, some nuggets in here about what B'nai B'rith is all about. I don't think we have time tonight to go into it, but he can do that for you. Snow White and the Seven Nubs. <laughs> Nubby Mouse. All nubs go to heaven. Oh, man. Nubby land. Okay. So, Edgar Magnin, he encouraged uh, the people in the Jewish Mafia and others who were in B'nai B'rith, movie producers, um, that Hollywood needed to protect itself by putting Walt Disney in the limelight as a Christian white knight of family values. Now, don't come after me. All of this stuff is from freaking biographies okay I'm not I'm not trying to attack entire swaths of people but this is just what I came up with from research many of the major filmmakers were so corrupt that they were out of touch with moral issues but they thought that Walt knew black from white and Walt was named man of the year in 1955 by the B'nai B'rith chapter of Beverly Hills Here he is. Um, being named Man of the Year by Jewish B'nai B'rith. Yeah, B'nai B'rith is Jewish Freemasonry, Clint says. Yes. Mafia is also B'nai B'rith. <laughs> the Nubby King. The Little Nub. No. That's not good. In 1930, the movie industry made a production code. So this is now where you have your ratings, you know, your PG and your G and your R ratings and stuff like that. This is what this comes from. The Emperor's New Nubs. That's good. So, 1930, they made the production code which stated that it must make a special effort to create movies appropriate for children. Hollywood directly praised Disney in that code as an exemplary model of what the industry wanted to do. Almost overnight, movie studios that had been turning out violent, um, essexually suggestive, uh, albeit profitable films, they all jumped on the bandwagon and were now eager to show Walt's clean, wholesome, and politically correct cartoons. Now, I didn't even get into the part um, where he was working with his friend, um, what is his name exactly? Nobody knows who really came up with all these Mickey Mouse and, uh, he has a weird name. It's probably in here. Ub, Ub Iwerks, yes. So everyone knows the name of Walt Disney. Nobody knows who Ub is because Disney took all of his stuff and cut him out. So, 
While its clean, wholesome, politically correct cartoons caught the eye of Hollywood mogul Carl Lemley, who had essentially stolen Disney cartoons character Oswald the Lucky Rabbit, and was now interested in the first talking character called Mickey Mouse in the cartoon Steamboat Willie. Uh, Walt was the facade Hollywood needed to hide behind to make Americans think that they had morals. Sleeping Nubby. I like that. Finding Nubby, that's probably one of the best ones. I like Finding Nubby. Num nubbo? No. Okay. So while Hollywood was immersed in scandals from the start, uh, Walt Disney Studios had strict standards. Um, in the 30s, Disney had a dress code that required men in ties and women in modest colored skirts. If a man looked at a woman in the wrong way, he risked being instantly fired. Uh, Walt was the perfect example of the strictest legalism. So even during the 50s, if an employee were caught saying anything considered a cuss word such as hell, they were instantly fired no matter who they were. He would not allow his employees to have any facial hair, even though he himself had a mustache. He never allowed employees to have alcohol at the studios, but he was known to drink heavy amounts of liquor in his private office for decades, and he was a chain smoker. He obviously had a lot of anxiety, as we're going to see. He had a lot of mental problems that a lot of people don't know about. Walt Nubby. I'm trying to think of one. Clint says my grandpa got fired from Disneyland for having a cherry tattoo on his thumb. Okay. That's a weird tattoo. Keep the puns Disney related. <laughs> I like all nubs go to heaven. The Land Before Nub, that's not necessarily a Disney movie, but Don Bluth did used to work for Disney and then he went on to make Land Before Time and All Dogs Go to Heaven, so. Which were pretty um, traumatic, actually. Like, even on par with Bambi and Lion King uh, as far as themes of death and abandonment. I like Sleeping Nubby. I like Nubarella. Nubby and the Beast. There you go. That's my contribution. Okay. So this is making him very successful, working with Benai Barith. He got Time Magazine Man of the Year. Who just got that? Taylor's, no, not Man of the Year, but she was on Time Magazine. You know, if they make it to Time Magazine, it's going to be uh, <clears throat> not for a good reason. T Denny999, I just discovered your channel, Jamie. I'm already learning things. All the best. Thank you so much. Stick around. It will blow your mind. <clears throat> Rachel says, the little nubby. Yes. Nubby and the Beast. <clears throat> so with the power of the Benai Barith and the ADL behind him, Walt began sailing to fame. In 1937, he and his family took a European vacation. Wherever the group traveled, Disney's name appeared in giant letters on movie marquees. The most famous international figures of film, literature, religion, science, and politics lined up to meet him. Guess who he met with? In England, he dined with the royal family and met privately with sci-fi writer H.G. Wells. He was the first to outline and help make plans for a new world order. H.G. Wells was, right? So here he's already rubbing elbows with um, the top baddies. Not baddies in a good way. Not like cute girl baddies, like bad baddies. <laughs> the Nubby King, yes. So when he went to Rome, 
Disney was granted an audience with the Pope and Mussolini. In Paris, the League of Nations awarded him with a special medal, which he accepted using the voice of Mickey Mouse. Um, in 1938, Disney received an honorary Master of Fine Arts from Yale for having created a new language of art. By the early 1960s, <clears throat> the Disney Empire was a major success and Walt Disney Productions had established itself as the world leading producer of family entertainment. He was head of pageantry at the 1960 Winter Olympics. So he is a very celebrated, um, <clears throat> important, famous person. He's meeting with royalty, with H.G. Wells, League of Nations, you name it. Master of Ceremonies at the Olympics. In 1940, he began his foray into political activism. The Hunchback of Notre Dame. I like it. I like it. A Nub's Life. Yes. Good one, Mella. Nubble. How about instead of Flubber, Nubber? Remember that goofy movie, Flubber, with... Uh, Robin Williams, what a crazy thing. So now it's 1940, he's going into activism. He's being nurtured by his staff attorney, Gunther Lessing. They began attending American NAZI meetings and rallies. What? One of Walt's motives for doing so may have been to regain favor with the NAZI occupied countries where American films were banned. Then um, Arthur Babbitt, Walt's co-worker and union activist, he recalls, in the immediate years before we entered the war, there was a small but fiercely loyal, I suppose legal, following of the NAZI party. You could buy a copy of Mein Kampf on any newsstand in Hollywood. Nobody asked me to go to meetings, but I did out of curiosity. On more than one occasion, I observed Walt Disney and Gunther Lessing there along with a lot of other prominent NAZI-affiliated Hollywood personalities. Disney was going to meetings all the time. I was invited to the homes of several prominent actors and musicians, all of whom were actively working for the American NAZI party. So, while on one hand he's holding the hand of Benai Barith, on the other hand he's like going to NAZI meetings, so this is getting crazy, right? <clears throat> yes, Nubarella. Keep them coming. 101 Nubmations. Alice in Nubberland. Totally. So when NAZI filmmaker Lenny Reifenstahl visited Hollywood in 1938 to promote her documentary Triumph of the Will, there's the will again, Walt greeted her publicly. Walt admired Tiny Mustache Man for his orderliness and totalitarianism. Tiny Mustache Man, however, hated Mickey Mouse and called him the most miserable ideal ever revealed and unsuccessfully tried to have it banned from his Reich. So, the nub bug. Oh, Herbie the love nub. Disney did have a tiny mustache. He did. Yes, Napoleon Wilson says the love nub. Honey, I nub the kids. Let's check our donuts. You, you. Got some. Kristen, five donuts. Thanks. You're welcome, babe. Daniel Flores gives me ten donuts and a prayer for five dollars. Thank you so much, Daniel. I appreciate it. We're having fun tonight. We've got, ooh, 440 people. That's a record. That is a new record. We are nubbing it up in the um, chat room. If you've just joined us, if you don't know how goofy this chat can get. Um, I don't even know how to explain what a nub is. Oh my gosh. Somebody, it's something that came from Jay and it went to Patrick's chat room. Can you, it was like, oh, they're talking about 
evolution and how goofy that is to think of something that evolved with like half of a nub as a genitals and what is it going to mate with and what, is, what good is it to evolve, you know, a nub. So that's what nubs are. Micro peepees. So there was some um, rebellions going on at Walt Disney Studios in Burbank in the 40s. And uh, I have a picture of this striking. All of the studio employees are striking. Life at Studios was not a fairy tale. Walt's large number of employees never received any credit or recognition for their years of creativity and hard work, which was essentially stolen. Just like Ub Iwerks. No, Nub Iwerks. That's obvious. Um, <clears throat> credit was given to Walt by the elite establishment to build his image. Employees at Disney did not have titles. It was faceless egalitarianism with an all-powerful dictator at the top. It was said that he could bring his artists to tears or anger in a matter of seconds. The studio was racially elitist um, <clears throat> and sexist. The only full-time African-American employee during Walt's lifetime at Disney was a black shoeshine man. At the studio in Burbank, Disney built a private club for his animators with a coffee shop, a gymnasium, theater and sun decks. Since only men were allowed in the animating department, he called it a womanless paradise. Uh, should I go into that right now? Women in the workplace. No, let's not. We're having fun. Let's not talk about that. In a press release describing the club, Disney declares the woman may have taken over the bars and the barbershops, but they still can't crash the profession of animation. The only skirted artists in the studio are the girls who trace the animator's drawings onto celluloid and paint them. So Disney did not have a very high opinion of women as artists or employees. He thought of his segregated studio as the perfect creative environment. Employees were required to punch in and out on the time clock wherever they had to go to the restroom, get a drink of water, or sharpen a pencil. Um, in spite of his public distaste for communism, his magic empire was run like a socialist dictatorship. Nubacabana. Oh, man. Not Disney, but the land before Nub. Yeah, that's what I was talking about. Um, Don Bluth used to work for Disney. And I do have a whole thing about Land Before Time as the first movie that traumatized me. Finding Nubbo. So there's, yeah, this is crazy. Like, there's been a lot of discourse about women in the workplace. I don't know if I should get all into that. I don't want to make any enemies. What do you guys think? Should women have jobs or not? I don't... <sighs> Never mind. Let's soldier on with Disney. So he considered himself not just an employer at his studio, but also as a type of father to his boys, as he often referred to his artists. Um, when the artists demanded union representation, Disney took it as an act of family betrayal and refused to negotiate with them. Studio employees went on strike in May of 1941 with over a thousand picketers, including 580 Disney employees, appearing in the first hour. So when the strike went into its second month, Walt was having a nervous breakdown, one of many already. Uh, Paul says, Jamie and I reviewed the <laughs> Nub Skewers Down Under. Yes, the Rescuers Down Under and the Rescuers. That was, that was a really good show. Plenty of jobs around the house. See, that's the thing. It's like, 
if you took women out of the workforce right now, the world would fall apart. Who Who is going to do hospice care? Not men. Who is going to do nursing? Not men. Who is going to do child care? I know children should be with their actual mother, but at the way things are, they need things now like daycares. Who's going to do that? Not men. So women need to be in the workforce. Who, who's going to do these jobs that nobody wants to do? And what, what if you can't, what if you don't have anybody to support you? You have to work. You're welcome, Melissa. I appreciate women who have to work. They shouldn't. And they should be given a choice. You can't just eliminate all women from all business. It sounds crazy. Who's going to clean up the pee and poo? Illegal. <laughs> no. Okay. Um, let's see. So the strike is in its second month. Walt's having a nervous breakdown. He cannot believe his family is turning against him. Um, so fearing his brother's rapidly deteriorating condition, Roy Disney appealed directly to J. Edgar Hoover for help. They arranged an ambassador of goodwill trip for Walt to South America to help persuade him um, to take the trip. The government paid $100,000 to make films during the tour. So this is where they get a lot of the footage from the movies I was perusing last night um nature footage and like lemmings running off cliffs and stuff actually that's not even true like that whole wise tale of lemmings run off the cliff they made them do that for the camera they don't really do that um they forced all the poor lemmings to go off the cliff for to get a good shot and that's one just like a tiny little way that People think that lemmings commit suicide, but they don't from footage from Walt Disney. It Noski Natasha says, not going to lie, I hate working, so I'm down to not work. You should be able to not work if you don't want to work, but you should be able to support yourself if you have to. A lot of these idyllic ideas are just, you know, on... On paper, it sounds great, but it's just not very practical. Like, who is going to nurse and caretake and nurture if you take all the women out of the workforce? Do you really want men running daycares? They don't even hire men at daycare for very obvious reasons. Because... <laughs> no, I'm not going to say that. Back to Walt. Uh, let's see. So they give him money to go to South America. They go um, in August on a much publicized journey. The footage he took on that trip would become the movie The Three Caballeros, which features Donald as a lecherous and horny duck chasing Spanish women. Remember that? In Walt's absence, Roy worked with the U.S. Department of conciliation to help settle the strike that officially ended in September 1941. The strike soured Walt's attitude towards unions, so in 1944, together with other Hollywood personalities, he helped form the Anti-Communist Motion Picture Alliance for the Preservation of American Ideals. That's a mouthful. So this is a group that served as a body of supporters within the film industry that were willing to testify publicly against possible communists in Hollywood. And this is when they started going after people. Um, I can think of one case in particular, Lucille Ball. Um, they really went after her and Desi Arnaz very heavily because Lucille Ball's grandfather was a communist and Desi Arnaz was from Cuba. So they were keeping a very close eye on a lot of people. There's even a movie about this too. I can't remember what it's called. Maybe something in the chat goes. The Three Nubaleros. Yes, exactly. So let's get into his birth scandal. So remember when he went to, 
apply for the Red Cross. He wasn't old enough. He was trying to get his birth certificate. Nobody knew anything. Uh, <clears throat> Waltz is not the only one who has a contested birth scandal. Um, good old Barack Obama. Remember that whole thing? Was he born in Kenya? Was he born in Hawaii? Was he born in Nigeria? Was he born in Indonesia? Uh, pick one. So even Tiny Mustache Man had this um, uh, parentage um, not, not exactly knowing if he was legitimate or not either. So you've got <laughs> Obama, Tiny Mustache Man, and Disney with these birth certificate scandals. Um, so Disney's true origins are about as obscure as the architect of the pyramid. And trust me, researching this topic <clears throat> will make you so frustrated. Um, I was trying to get to the bottom of this, and you really cannot. Um, it, it really just, you know, makes you want to quit altogether. Um, there was a historian from Barcelona named Carlos Alamendros. He spent 10 years studying the family origins of Disney without a concrete conclusion. So this is impossible. Um, many people from FBI agents to Franciscan monks have attempted to piece together his lineage, but no one can come up with a solid answer. Birth certificates are found. Um, they are that are found are either um, in error or falsified. I literally read every scrap of information I could about Walt's origins and came up more confused than I was when I began and nowhere closer to knowing anything. So the mysteries surrounding Disney's birth are here to stay. They're not going anywhere. I couldn't figure it out. I don't, this was 10 years ago, maybe now. Horse noise is here. Hi, how are you? <clears throat> Horsky. We're talking about nubs. It's that time again. Uh, finding out his true parentage isn't just the bane of my existence back then, but apparently it was Walt's as well. So he was just as frustrated as everyone else. <laughs> Um, the possibility that he was adopted or born out of wedlock haunted him almost his whole life and was a shadowy part of his character. And so far, all we have is a chronology of events. So this is the best I could do for y'all trying to figure out Walt Disney's origins. So what we do know, 1890... Walt's father, Elias, left his wife and two children to seek his fortune in the second wave of the California gold rush. He arrived home only weeks before the still unexplained listing of a birth of a Walter Disney in January 8, 1891, according to the Illinois Department of Vital Statistics. Around this time, he hired a maid who remained in the family employ for 35 years. When Elias died, Walt hired her as his personal housekeeper. She was said to be from a remote village in Mohacar, Spain. So, the plot thickens. The story, um, there's a story told by the villagers of Mohacar of a beautiful washerwoman named Isabella Zamora Asensio. She had an illegitimate baby with a doctor named Jose Guario. Gu it's G-U-I-R-A-O. Guaro. Shortly after, the doctor died and Isabel decided to take a boat to America. She ended up on the west coast at a Franciscan monastery. This was in 1890 and would have put her in California at the same time as Walt's father. When Walt became an official informant for the FBI in 1940, Two agents were sent on a mission to Mohacar. Their stated objective was to attain a baptismal certificate for an illegitimate baby named Jose um, Guaro, born around 1890 to a lady named Senora Isabel Zamora. The date is 11 years off of Walt's birthday. So what the heck and why are we even talking about this? Um, so shortly after returning from his ambassador trip to South America, 
Hoover contacted Walt about the secret mission to Spain. The Bureau had traced the origins of a woman who they believed could be his real mother. This news devastated Walt and he locked himself up in his office and sobbed through the night. Um, one unproven theory is that Elias and Isabella met in California and he brought her back to Chicago where he supported her. Um, in 1893, they had a son and Elias convinces his wife to accept the baby as theirs rather than have the family's reputation ruined. This would have been Walter's older brother, Roy, who looks nothing like his two older siblings. In 1901, Elias brings home another baby they name Walter. The two illegitimate children do not look like the other sons of Elias, and they never have much to do with them, but they cling to each other as brothers. When the local minister found out, Elias suddenly uprooted his family and moved to the Midwest. Elias kept Zamora as his housekeeper so that she had an excuse to move with them without creating suspicion and do most of the care and raising of the two boys. So this is just one of the many convoluted stories that you will find trying to research his origins, but one thing is for sure is that nothing adds up. Let's see what's going on in the nub room. Three dog nights. Grant's Modern Life says, Jamie, what's up? <clears throat> Nabokio? <clears throat> How about Lilo and Nubs? So this is getting pretty crazy. We don't know if Roy and Walt belong to Isabella from Spain or the other mother. Stories about his Spanish birth have become so established that eyewitnesses claim to have seen a plaque in the town of Mohacar announcing it as the birthplace of Walt Disney. Um, in this version, <laughs> A village maiden named Consuela Suarez had a baby with a local boy who died before they could get married. With the help of a local priest, the baby was adopted by an American couple who took him to the United States, and Consuela followed as their nanny. Only when she came home later on did she reveal to Townsfolk that her son was the famous Walt Disney. Now, this could just be, like, local folklore or whatever. But the FBI is getting in on it. And they are going to recruit him <clears throat> using this as sort of a not a blackmail, but enticing him to become involved with the FBI so that they can continue to do him this favor of trying to figure out his parentage, right? So, you know, writing these few paragraphs was so frustrating. It took two weeks of my, my life, and, you know, at the time, I refused to dedicate any more time to the subject. I really hate this story, and I will leave it here for some braver and more dedicated researchers to pick up the trail, knock yourself out. I don't think Walt even ever figured it out. It was really... an irritating uh, thing to, to research. So one thing we do know for sure though, according to documents that have come to light under the Freedom of Information Act is that from 1940 until his death in 1966, Walt Disney served as a secret informer for the Los Angeles Office of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. And here we even have some memorandums from Hoover to Walt Disney, all blacked out like you do when you're secret government FBI redacted, right? Logan Daly says, real tinfoil hat time. Is he cryogenically frozen somewhere? Maybe. Maybe so. The experts don't seem to think so, but it could be. Yep, 
Maybe his head is frozen like in um, Futurama. Remember, Futurama is just like all the famous people's heads preserved in jars. Um, let's see. The five movies, Snow White, Pinocchio, Bambi, Dumbo, and Fantasia are considered gold, uh, Disney's golden era. And these were the films that Walt personally had a hand in creating and have the common theme of a lost child's quest to find their real parents. Did y'all ever think about that? All these movies have that in common. So if Walt was an illegitimate child with mysterious origins, that would give the government something to blackmail him with or um, persuade him with. Or maybe they just took advantage of Walt's neurosis about family values and made the whole thing up. You may, you never know. They, I wouldn't put it past him. Uh, so a communication about Walt's family history between Disney and Hoover appears in a July 1936 memorandum one of the many attempts they had made as part of an ongoing campaign to recruit him. In it, Hoover writes, I am indeed pleased that we can be of service to you in affording you a means of absolute identity throughout your lifetime. Um, the meaning of absolute identity is unclear, but the document signifies the beginning of a long-term relationship between the two men. So the, the president and the creator of the FBI and Walt Disney are close now. So the government was aware of Disney before he was officially introduced in 1936 during his first months in the FBI. Uh, in 1918, J. Edgar Hoover was busily involved with the prosecution of draft dodgers in World War I. In keeping with the logic of the Bureau, he would also get to know the names of those volunteers like Disney who were so eager to serve that they would do anything to get into the military. It crossed his desk that Walt Disney had committed the crime of forging the document to join the Red Cross. Years later, when Disney became famous, the FBI ran a preliminary background check on him and uncovered the story of when Walt tried to find his birth certificate and join the army. J. Edgar Hoover skillfully used this information to exploit Disney's great conundrum and ensure his loyalty to the FBI. Why would the FBI be so interested in a cartoon man? And we're going to find out next time when we talk about Walt Disney's World of Warcraft. But we're not done yet here. We're just checking our business. And we're checking the nub, nub room, nub chats. Send me some super nubs. Sabrina says, Ed Sheeran is totally into the occult. What's that band that he said influenced him? Cradle of Filth. Ooh, I didn't know that. Cradle of Filth. I have to look that up. Yes, Aaron Christopher says, Bambi's mom being shot first five minutes was literally trauma-based mind control still pissed exactly hey Tweedle what's up lady in the nub my sophomore comment to try and join the fun yeah I said what beauty in the nub nubby in the beast super nubs um let's see where are we J Edgar Hoover and Disney so then in 1940 the deal was officially struck Hoover offered Disney the unlimited service of the FBI to find the truth of his parentage. In exchange, Walt agreed to assist in Hoover's crusade against the spread of, Holly of communism in Hollywood by becoming an official informant. As a bureau contact, Disney reported on the activities of Hollywood actors, writers, producers, directors, technicians, and union activists suspected of political subversion. Walt perceived his FBI commission not only as his patriotic duty, but a high moral obligation. He became obsessively devoted to spying as he once had been to making cartoons. I remember what was his favorite thing to play when he was young, Jimmy Dale, the junior secret agent. So he's probably 
reveling in this being some kind of, you know, secret informant to the FBI and J. Edgar Hoover. The lady in the nub. It's funny, if you're listening to this and you're not reading the chat, it's going to make no sense. And you're going to be like, why are they talking about nubs all the time? You just, you have to be there, man. You have to get here live and interact with these weird nubs in the chat. So, now he thinks he's Big Cheese spy. <clears throat> and in return, Disney sought cooperation from the Bureau for filming. Um, in 1956, they requested the right to use the Bureau's offices in Washington for the Mickey Mouse Club show. Now, isn't that what you think of when you think of Mickey Mouse Club? Is FBI, right? Not really, but they are always trying to introduce children to um, the FBI, to Werner von Ron, to CIA. Uh, Disney's officials promised that the Mouseketeers would be seen having fun with agents on their shooting range and that they would be the type of adults the children would look up to. The FBI found this satisfactory but insisted that some changes should be made in the script. So now we're working together. Because of the information Disney provided to the Bureau, he was made a full special agent in charge contact. Um, in 1954. So an SAC contact was usually a trusted informer who could provide transportation and equipment as well as public relations services to the Bureau. Um, Disney was not the only important informer in Hollywood. While president of the Screen Actors Guild in 1947, Ronald Reagan was designated Source T-10 by the FBI, meaning he was a confidential source with the codename T-10. So there's another marriage of Hollywood and politics with Ronald Reagan, who that's a whole story in itself, like the story of Nancy um, Reagan and Ronald Reagan. Like she was the mastermind behind the entire thing. She wanted them to be famous in Hollywood and they just weren't making it like she wanted. So she's like, you know what? Let's just run for office and see if we can get famous that way. So the FBI and <clears throat> Disney found an opportunity for mutual benefit in Disneyland, which we've talked about a lot, which opened in 1955. Um, a document in his file reads, quote, Mr. Disney has recently established a business association with the American Broadcasting Company Paramount Theaters Incorporated for the production of a series of television shows, which for the most part are scheduled to be filmed at Disneyland a multi-million dollar amusement park being established under Mr. Disney's direction in the vicinity of Anaheim, California. Mr. Disney has volunteered representatives of this office, the FBI, he's talking about, complete access to the facilities of Disneyland for use in connection with official matters and for recreational purposes. So this isn't just a theme park for kids, it's also a theme park for FBI and Hoover and whoever else, weird old politicians, like, hanging out, making Mouseketeer shows. Let's see. Nub heads. You want to talk about Bambi for a second? Everyone's been talking about Bambi tonight. I'm kind of glad because I have a whole weird stuff box all about Bambi. I don't know if you knew this. It was actually a book by a creeper named Felix Salton. Uh, <clears throat> and today's satanic Darwinian environmental movement, heavily backed by Disney, has its roots in a book called Bambi, written by an English corn maker Felix Salton. In Walt's original version, Bambi was to receive a Christ-like manger birth with the animals hailing him as a prince. Most of Disney's nature films focus heavily on the predator-prey relationship, the law of the jungle, which is also the basic law of Satanism as defined by Anton LaVey. So let's just think about this for a second because if you've ever been to 
um, Walt Disney World Animal Kingdom. This is all about getting you to believe in paganism, in old ways, in nature worship, in pan worship, um, in uh, animism, right? There's a spirit in everything, kind of like they did in Pocahontas. Uh, what's that? Colors of the wind. Everything has a spirit. The rocks, the trees, the wind is all um, animated by these uh, nature spirits that can be worshipped and that can be in service to you if you know how to access them. And this is where you get uh, the tree of life that, that you have to walk through when you go to the animal kingdom. So this is all wrapped up in um, nature worship. And then if you notice, whenever you have these animal documentaries, they can't help themselves. They have to put in the... Um, the predator prey scenes, you know, when the lion takes down the gazelle or whatever, like they can't even leave it out, even for kids and just show cute animals. You always have to have that, like, you know, hunter chase taking down the prey that, kid, you know, they're like, well, kid has to learn death somehow. But anyway, so Bambi, so many scenes in these nature shows involve the stalking, the killing, and the consuming side of nature while the peaceful, balanced, symbiotic relationships are ignored. This is meant to convince us that the survival of the fittest is the philosophy of nature, and man is nothing more than the top of the food chain, and he is a destructive element to the environment. The extension of this logic of Bambi um, is the basis for ideas of population rejection and eugenics. So the story of Bambi appealed to Walt because he always liked animals better than people. And you hear this in um, people who are abused, especially like uh, SRA survivors and stuff. They're like, I don't even trust anyone. I don't like people. I just want all animal companions because animals can't hurt you. So this is an something that Walt has in common with these type of people. Um, in the book, Bambi, tame animals view the humans as gods while free animals see humans as demons and they simply refer to people as him. So by the end of the book, the animals view all humans as simply being on the same level as animals, a vicious creature fit to be killed. Here's the cover of the old Bambi by a corn maker Felix Salton. I dare you to look him up and see what he's up to. So here is um a mistake that a lot of people make when they say Disney was a 33rd degree mason. No, he was not. I promise you if he was it would be all over every Masonic temple you've ever been to. He was not a 33rd degree Mason. His brother Roy was. Walt, however, was um, in Demolay. So if you Google Disney Freemason, you will most likely find yourself like, you know, dwarf deep in Masonic conspiracy territory. Um, there is no evidence that he was a Freemason. Roy was. Walt was heavily involved in the Order of Demolay, which is a fraternal organization created for boys who had lost their fathers during World War I. Now, Demolay was named after Jacques Demolay, who uh, was executed, I think, on like October 13th. Um, and that's where we get the idea that Friday the 13th is unlucky because of this. So, Demolay begins like many, um, where the order of Demolay begins like a lot of Disney movies do with the death of a parent. Um, when a young man named Louis Lower lost his father, a fellow craft mason, it spurred the senior warden of Ivanhoe Freemasonic Lodge to call his Masonic brother Frank Land and ask for help. Land asked Lower if he would 
like to form a club and meet at the Masonic Temple. Lewis thought the idea had possibility and showed up the next week with eight other boys. So they sought a name for the club, and after many biblical fraternal names were discarded, one young man suggested that the name be something connected with masonry. At the time, Frank was serving as the head of one of the Masonic groups as the commander for the Demolay Council of Kadosh. He told them the story about the last leader of the Knights nice Templar, whose name was Jacques Demolay, or as they say, um, James of Mole, you could also call him. There were nine original poor Knights of Christ, otherwise known as Knights Templar. The mythic knights were sanctioned by the Roman Catholic Church in 1128 to guard the road between Jerusalem and Acre, and were also legendary for their participation in the Crusades. Since there were also nine boys gathered to form the club, the order was founded under the name of the martyred Templar Jock Dimole. I know Clint's going to, I know he's going to have something to say about this. He says, the death of the Templars, 1013, 1313, something, 1314, yeah. Ten, and 1013 <clears throat> has a lot of, um, been popping up a lot in pop culture, just like the big nine number does. Uh, Chris Carter, the creator of X-Files, his production company is called 1013. There's a bunch of them. I'll, I'll have to, like, gather up all that info in my head if we want to talk about 1013, but... Friday the 13th comes from the execution of Jacques Dimoulin. So in March of 1919, um, the Order of the Dimoulin was launched, and during the next few years, um, <clears throat> the date of March 18th, the day that had witnessed... No, that's not true. Where am I? Okay, so Demolay is considered to be part of the, the general family of Masonic and associated organizations, along with other youth groups such as Job's Daughters and Rainbow Girls. Um, a young man does not need to have a family connection to Masonry in order to join Demolay. Clint's going off. He says what? The Templars were a long story. Parts were taken over by the Hashishim. Yeah. That's a whole ball of wax. That's a whole live stream. So, Order of um, the Kansas City chapter, Walt joined in 1920 at age 19 and became the 107th member of the original mother chapter of Demolay. In 1931, Walt received the Demolay Legion of Honor. He wasn't just a member, he was also a hometown boy. In Walt's address at the Demolay conference, he emotionally declared, I feel a great sense of obligation and gratitude toward the Order of Demolay for the important part it played in my life. Its precepts have been invaluable in making decisions, facing dilemmas and crisis. Demolay stands for all that is good for the family and for our country. I feel privileged to have enjoyed membership. So, I mean, there's a reason people think that he was a Mason. I mean, here's an official envelope with Walt and Roy on it. You've got the Compass and Square and the Demolay International. Um, you've got Disneyland Masonic Club. Yes, that was a real thing. Um, you've got Club 33, that super um, exclusive, expensive, mysterious club that you can join at Disneyland if you are um, privileged and wealthy. And you even have more signs and symbols of masonry in Disneyland. If you go on um, Splash Mountain in Disneyland, I don't know if this is still there, but this is a picture I literally took myself in the uh, props and the fake like Gold Rush working tours. It's at, uh, no, it's Thunder Mountain Railroad, not Splash Mountain. There's a box that says H Abyss Working Tools. This is at Disneyland. And it's got your compass, um, your plum, or your trowel, all of these, the working tools of the Master Mason. H Abiff stands for Hiram Abiff, who they say is the first Master Mason. So there's a reason why people think that Walt was a Mason, but he wasn't. Now, while his Freemasonic connections are obscure, 
<clears throat> Many like to refer to the super expensive private club 33 of Disneyland to say he was given an honorary membership to the Supreme Mother Council of Freemasonry, Scottish Rite, but this um, cannot be proven. And I think they would have bragged about it a lot more if that had happened. I mean, that happened to Manly P. Hole. Um, they made him an honorary Mason because he just like knew so much about it. But I don't think that that happened to Walt Disney. So... There are other clues to suggest that Freemasons do, though, have their hand in Walt Disney World. <clears throat> As you rumble down the Big Thunder Mountain roller coaster, you see H Abyss working tools. <clears throat> so let's talk about his odd behavior. Um, you've got him posing as, you know, the bastion of morality in Hollywood. He was what saved it and pulled it out of the corn quagmire uh, of Babylon when things were crashing in Hollywood. They're thinking that it's all, I mean, crashing in American economy. They're thinking that it's all Hollywood's fault. And <clears throat> Walt Disney swooped in there or was recruited to save them from that. But it seems like Walt was under tremendous amounts of pressure um, for his entire life. Not only from his parents, um, the government and the public, but also from himself. He, on one hand, he genuinely wanted to be the upstanding Christian example like his father preached. But the burden of this was also what I think, you know, made him crack. So, behind, <clears throat> behind fronts of strict observances of morals, you will often find massive amounts of guilt and a dirty mind. Um, just kind of like his father, who had all of these vices, but on the other hand would rail against, uh, you know, wickedness in the city or whatever. You always, these people are very um, polarized um, and tortured in their thinking and behavior. We haven't even saying anything. We, all we've been doing is talking about nubs all night. It's just, it's the night of nubs. Let's check our donuts. So <clears throat> people like Tiny Mustache Man had these same um, obsessions. He would obsessively wash his hands many times a day, which is a sign of a guilty conscience. So did Walt several times an hour every hour. Now these are all the weirdest things that I picked up from his biographies and um, you know s stories of his life. Uh, this is peppered from many different sources, anything that stood out to me that was like, whoa, that's weird. I put it in this um, part of the chapter. Logan Daly says, is nub wave not a good, yeah, it's good enough. It's nub enough. But no one's even asked me to sing. I couldn't even remember that dang journey song. Oh. When you just hear the beginning of it, it just makes you want to like, mm, yeah like work out or something. It's the one where they're at the docks. Ooh, Paul's sending me lots of donuts and cakes. Thank you. I like it. I like seeing these sweet emojis in my chat. <laughs> it's nubber enough. Yeah, so Walt and Tiny Mustache Man could never wash their hands enough to get rid of their guilty conscience. Um, Walt had black hair and a mustache. He used his own facial features to clue artists in on how to draw Mickey Mouse's features. He was usually the voice behind Mickey, but his unsupportive mother told him she didn't like Mickey's voice and that he sounded like a sissy. Poor thing. The next time Mickey would appear, he was mostly silent in Fantasia. So supposedly the idea for the Sorcerer's Apprentice came from a dream Walt had of having complete control of the earth and the elements. Now, if you want that Fantasia breakdown, we've got it. Me and Paul did it so well. Um, 
we did like Fantasia and Fantasia 2. I think I did that one with um, PSYOP Cinema Guys. Now, if you want the second best uh, channel for analyzing movies, there is, it's called PSYOP Cinema. It is super um, informative and intelligent. It's, it's this, it's so good. After J, it's the best. So yeah, Slap Cinema, we, we did Fantasia 2. And I just found out something crazy. <sighs> Me and Jay are going to do um, a show about the Mormon endowment movement. So when you join the Mormon church, you go through this ritual, and part of it is they show you a movie called their endowment movie. And it's like the story of creation and Adam and Eve and the fall and Lucifer and um, all of that. But back in the day, so they make the movie like every couple, like maybe every 10 years or so they make a new one. Um, or they just redo it. But back in the day, they were using scenes from Fantasia from that Stravinsky creation scene. Um, they put that in the Mormon endowment movie. So that is like super WTF and that's what like tipped me off and I'm like we're gonna have to watch this whole thing and uh, analyze it for you so wait for that to come up. How do we get off track? Oh, okay so Fantasia, he didn't want to put Mickey's voice in Fantasia because his mom didn't like it. That sucks. That sucks. <clears throat> so Walt likes specially rolled brown cigarettes which he smoked 70 a day. He picked up his smoking habit in the army and loved expensive scotch whiskey. He played lots of golf with Bob Hope at his ranch in Palm Springs. Bob Hope is one of those people who have been identified um, by SRA survivors as a major handler. So between Walt's ranch and the studio and his private quarters above the fire station on Main Street Disneyland, Walt was hardly ever at home at his estate in Holmby Hills. He would go for weeks on end without seeing his family. Often the main topic at the studio was Walt's bizarre behavior. He would never be available until late afternoon when he emerged from the studio's subterranean underground where he was supposedly chatting with the maintenance engineers all day. So are, are we connecting some dots here? Remember I played you that clip um, last week of the family that let their little girl go into the bathroom alone and never came out because they think that she disappeared into the floor. So there are definitely underground uh, subterranean halls going on under Disney World and Disneyland. You've got the FBI involved, you've got the CIA involved in creating Disney World. So there's definitely something nefarious going on underneath Disneyland. Um, <clears throat> so in 1945, Walt was suffering from a kind of nervous breakdown. And so why is he having so many nervous breakdowns, right? He retired as president of the studio. He appointed Roy as the new one. He began to spend all his time sequestered in his private inner office which some employees jokingly called Walt's Chamber of Horrors. So this is getting very um, Howard Hughes. Like he's becoming a recluse. He's suffering from anxiety, washing his hands 20 times a day, smoking three packs a day, um, not living his best life. He's not thriving at this point. He would play with trains to pass the time and supervise by intercom the building of a miniature steam locomotive for his house in Holmby Hills. He painstakingly saw to it that every detail of the train was perfect. He stopped going to work. He missed meetings. He missed meals. He refused to go to bed so he could keep riding his choo-choo. Okay, this does not sound like somebody who's having a good time. The only thing that brought him out of his funk was a legal battle with his former co-worker, Arthur Babbitt. Um, so people who knew Walt personally 
knew he had an obsession with buttocks. Now, this is, I, I swear to you, this stuff I got from his straight biographies and, like, normie sources. Um, he's obsessed with butts. He told butt jokes to his staff frequently, and most of his jokes had to be edited from cartoon scripts. So, <laughs> Disney cartoons could have been a lot dirtier if they didn't, if they kept in all the butt jokes that Disney wanted. Um, many cartoons feature characters' butts provocatively twitching. One that got by the editors was a Christmas special where a little boy is unable to button the drop seat of his pajamas. I'm thinking of, like, remember those hippos dancing in Fantasia with all their butts? Walt loves his butts and nubs. Never mind. Um... So the, in this Christmas cartoon, the little boy's problem in maintaining his modesty is the running gag of the cartoon. And in the end, Santa gives him a chamber pot for Christmas. That's gross. Um, <clears throat> another example of his butt fetish was in Fantasia when two mating centaurs bring their backsides together to form a single beating heart. Uh, apparently, Walt was not only obsessed with anus, but also what came out of it. One co-worker recalls, that he could talk about turds for 30 minutes straight. So this is the guy who is the most beloved children's uh, media producer of all time. 22 Academy Awards, 59 nominations, 7 Emmys, 950 honors, meeting royalty, 48 Academy Awards. Uh, all of these accolades and he could go on about turds for 30 minutes straight. <laughs> I like all the peaches in the chat. So for an artist, Walt was pretty, um, how should we say, unromantic. He treated his marriage like a business partnership. Um, Walt and Lillian spent their wedding night on a train from Idaho to Los Angeles. He suddenly developed a toothache and began to pace up and down for almost an hour. He visited the club car where he had his shoe shined dozens of times over and over all night. This is his wedding night. When they arrived in Los Angeles, they boarded a steamer for Seattle, and it wasn't until they reached Washington that Walt was able to consummate the marriage. Now, I know traveling is tough. Okay, but this is crazy, and he, it, it seemed like he, he wasn't really romantically um, interested in his wife. The next day, he cut the honeymoon short, stating that he had to get back to work at the studio right away. This came as no surprise once he explained his motivation for the marriage in the first place. He said, quote, I realized that I'd need a new roommate, so I proposed to Lily. Mm, that's just what every girl wants to hear. You think he made her go 50-50? He asked her what she could bring to the table. I mean, like, I need a roommate. Somebody says, Jay and Tristan really nailed the Wicker Man last night. Yeah, that was really good. If you didn't see that, go look it up. It was really funny. They did the 1970s Wicker Man and the new Nick Cage Wicker Man, and they contrasted them. It was really good. So we are almost done. We have a couple more paragraphs about how weird Walt Disney was. We've gone over his whole life from his birth to his involvement in the FBI. Nobody still knows. <clears throat> who his real parents were, or if there even was a uh, scandal in the first place. We've talked about Bambi by the corn maker Felix Salton. Animism, Walt in the Demole, Walt Masonic uh, connection. And now his very deep, dark, personal feelings towards um, his wife. Not a lot of romantic love going on there. He'd rather talk about turds. So, for someone who was supposed to be providing the ultimate in family entertainment, he didn't like kids very much. Um, according to Kenneth Anger, now, 
take this with a grain of salt because it's Kenneth Anger, um, a, a Satanist. But he said that he used to open a small rounded door in the wall, a fairy tale door that creaked, and take his guest down a winding staircase into a dungeon filled with racks and iron maidens scaled to the size of a five-year-old. Now this is how I really feel about the little bastards, he say, and puff on his cigar. And that is from... Kenneth Anger told that to High Times Reader. Annie Nokati and Ruth Baldwin. I don't know what year that was. It was in the High Times Reader. But that's one of the weirdest things I've ever heard about Walt Disney. Let's read that one more time. Because it's just so like WTF. According to Kenneth Anger, he used to open a small rounded door in the wall, a fairy tale door that creaked, and take his guests down a winding staircase into a dungeon filled with racks and iron maidens scaled to the size of a five-year-old. Now this is how I really feel about the little bastards, he'd say, and puff on his cigar. What? <laughs> yeah, Natoski, wait, what? <laughs> yeah. So, it's getting weird. Yeah, Grant's Modern Life says, Isaac and Jay need to do more streams together as well. Yes, I agree, and I would love to do some more with Isaac because our stuff is so parallel. Um, I think we have a lot of good content, um, but we're both, like, hard to schedule. So, we, um, we might... In the future, after our show in Los Angeles, next Friday, if you are in California, if you're in Arizona, if you're in Nevada, please, 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 please come to our super fun event in Los Angeles, May 15th, Friday, May 15th. Um, it's a five-hour, like, party with lectures, with comedy, with Jamie Kennedy, with me, Jamie, um, talking about the beginning of theater and Anunnaki's and play acting and uh, incarnating gods into yourself and this is what came to be what uh, we think of as theater and how that all ties into Hollywood and witchcraft. It's going to be crazy. Um, yeah, Jamie and Isaac, we may be doing a um, live event in Las Vegas with Isaac um, in maybe six months time. but week from tomorrow we're gonna be in LA please 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 come I told you guys this last time it's so fun you might meet your best friend you might meet the love of your life there we are already responsible for several marriages of people who met at our uh, events and meetups so yeah so Walt's having um, <clears throat> tiny uh, torture museums I don't know if you can prove this I don't know if you can believe Kenneth Anger <clears throat> but he said it to High Times Reader. <coughs> <clears throat> so Walt had two daughters, Diane Marie and Sharon May. He was very distant towards both of them. He was a man with a lot of money, but he took no joy in spoiling them, according to eyewitnesses. His daughter, Diane, recalls that he would not allow her any money for horses, which she loved, clothes, or anything else. He was also famous for his 10 cent tips at restaurants. Uh, during the military occupation of his studio, he decided that he would start going to church and spending more time with his kids. So this, um, the military occupation is where we're gonna start next week because in 1941, uh, the day after the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor within um, you know 24 hours, Congress, declared war and Walt Disney arrived to work at his studio in Burbank to be stopped at a checkpoint and made to confirm his identity. His studio had been commandeered by the United States government and Lockheed, um, well, it was a defense station to guard the nearby Lockheed plant. All the film equipment was replaced with weaponry and the parking lot was filled to capacity with Jeeps during this occupation, 90% of its production was the service of government propaganda films. So that's what we're going to talk about next week. So share it back to his kids. Sharon May was an adopted daughter, and she arrived at the Disney home 
In December 1936, the newspapers around the country announced that Lillian had given birth to Sharon and the Disney family kept up this lie for years. So why would they adopt a baby and then say that the wife had given birth? That's weird. Um, the reason given for Sharon's adoption was that Diane needed a playmate. Um, in June of 1948, when Sharon was 12, Walt took her to Alaska with him for about two months. Um, for most of the trip, they were alone together. So a father who had ignored her for years was now totally obsessed with her. He bathed Sharon every night, combed her hair, washed her underwear, and carefully dressed her each night from head to toe before taking her to nice restaurants. Weird. Um, Walt hated the idea of death, as most wicked people do. Uh, he avoided funerals, and if he had to attend one, it would always put him in a deep depression. So that's why we talk about, um, like, people who try to do life extensions and transhumanism. It's because they are trying to outrun, outsmart nature and judgment and live as long as possible. Uh, this is the idea of the Faustian bargain is that you try to prolong your life as much as possible because there is hell to pay in the afterlife. Um, when Walt died in 1966, no details were made public and all reporters were able to discover that secret rites had been conducted at Forest Lawn Cemetery. So that's all they can say about his funeral was that there were secret rites. Um, his employees at the studio were encouraged to act as if he were still alive by quoting him in the present tense. Um, like example, Walt says instead of Walt says, said past tense. So that's pretty crazy. Yeah, where are all my nubs at? Nubby and Empire? <laughs> yes. Breathless hearts. Baby, I'm reaching for you. Okay, more donuts. Sabrina, thank you so much. Thanks, Jamie. I did the Walt talk even though I'm suffering from PTSD because I was under the Disneyland spell for most of my life. Great stream. Yeah, thank you, Sabrina. I think most people were um, in under the Disneyland spell for most of their lives. So we are attempting to pull back the curtain on the wizard. And I look so squinty when I do these because I need glasses. And I'm trying to read all of your nubs, but I have to squint to do it. Oh, yeah. Slow boy says, in the afterlife, you could be headed for a serious strife. Now you make the scene all day, but tomorrow there'll be hell to pay. Yes, exactly. In the afterlife. So Disney, as we have seen, Walter E. Disney, he is the epitome of the sorcerer's ability to create images. Um, his golden name was so methodically engineered to be that way. He had a personal image builder named Joe Reddy who worked full time to build Walt's image. Today, every employee of Disney from uh, a top manager to a food service vendor is required to attend an employee orientation experience called Traditions the first day on the job. <clears throat> the course is designed to immerse each employee into the Disney vision and mission. Its very purpose is to build and continue a desired organizational culture where they learn to enjoy thinking the Disney way. So that is the life of Walt Disney and if you want to Look into his birth scandal, um, you're going to be frustrated, but do it if you want. I, I literally took two weeks trying to find out, with the help of the entire World Wide Web, Walt's parentage and all this. Um, I haven't looked into it since then. Maybe there's new stuff. I don't know if you can um, find it. You can definitely come back here next week and super chat me or just um, nub it up in the chat room. And <clears throat> one good book to read uh, about this is called Walt Disney Hollywood's Dark Prince by Mark Elliott. Um, other books that I use, um, 
not a complete list, but some. Disney's World by Leonard Mosley, Walt Disney and American Ritual by Original by Bob Thomas, um, Deeper Insights into the Illuminati Formula by Fritz Springmeier, and Walt Disney, The Triumph of the American Imagination by Neil Gabler. And that was the um, title of the book where I, I quoted um, at the very beginning um, about how Walt Disney helping change the national consciousness. So let's look for our donuts one last time and see if anybody said anything. We're all good there. So <clears throat> I hope people can come see us next Friday. Um, I don't know if I'll be doing a live stream before then, but here is a sneak peek of next time. Mickey joins the army, Donald Duck, Daisy Duck, Pluto, and they're off to war. Walt Disney's World of Warcraft, and that person who mentioned the pentagram in the Mickey ear was spot on. So thank you guys all for coming. Melissa says Jamie is the queen of Disney for sure. Yeah, man, let's get on Rogan about Disney. Let's get on, uh, who else? Let's get on some big ones. Let's get on Candace. Let's get on Michaela Peterson. Let's get on, uh, who else do we like? <clears throat> thank you guys so much, and, um, I hope to see you at our live event. Have a good night.